First of all, uh, my apologies for, for the delay, uh, which, uh, which is probably another way of learning Mumbai. Uh, coming from Istanbul, uh, not, not unfamiliar really, but uh, this rush hour traffic uh, caused a delay that I would like to apologize for. And, uh, and many thanks for the warm welcome, the patience, uh, the interest, and the uh, and, uh, meaningful exchange that I would uh, look forward to. So today, I will try to share some thoughts on about a humble experience that has emanated from Turkey and has been trying to communicate itself in many corners of the world and trying to learn from what different communities in the world reflect and how they respond to that experience. It is, as I said, an experience that originated in Turkey, but claims a human agenda uh, that embraces everyone and that is eager and uh, ready to, f to learn from everyone, which we prefer to call his met movement, a movement that has focused its energy on education and intercultural dialogue for peace building. In a nutshell, Hizmet is a transnational civic movement that promotes philanthropy, education, and dialogue. This movement embraces and defends global discourses of democracy, human rights, pluralism, participation, and transparency. It has originated in Turkey in late 60s, early 70s, around the ideas of Muslim scholar, intellectual, and author, Mr. Fethullah Gülen. The movement, given its grassroots nature, has, has very well-known uh, grassroots characteristics. It is independent, non-governmental, non-political form of collective social altruism, which demonstrates a very flexible uh, free entry, free exit form of organization where people take part in certain initiatives that they are interested in and uh, if not, prefer not to do so. And warmly welcomes people from all walks of life. Uh, not only within the uh, Turkish landscape, but throughout its 20-year transnational uh, experience, uh, the movement has attracted people from all world communities as supporters, sympathizers, or participants. But it doesn't have a form of membership or a, or a prototype of uh, a follower. So the, given the cultural codes of the country where it started and uh, given the fact that Mr. Fethullah Gülen, the honorary chairman of our foundation and the person who envisioned the movement's uh, structure, the movement is uh, a faith-inspired movement. When you look at Mr. Gülen's rhetoric, his references as a as a preacher, his sermons, books, you see frequent references to Islamic values that he translates, tries to translate into a motivation for community-oriented projects, which means the movement is not a faith-oriented movement. It is not a faith-specific movement that tries to communicate a certain faith, Islam in this case, to non-Muslim communities. It does not claim to have uh, a mission, uh, quote-unquote. It is non-contentious and non-adversarial and demonstrates a proactive nature and distances itself from all sorts of protests 
or reactionary activism. The individual, the participant, is encouraged to be the driving agent, the motivating agent in the movement. So people get together, decide on projects collectively, and undertake those projects, monitor the success of the projects themselves, and then try to implement new ones in new destinations. So people are expected to step forward and take action themselves. It has a very strong bottom-up uh, nature. And throughout its already four-decade uh, history, the movement is now a loosely connected network of education, relief, health, media, um, and business initiatives around the globe. Education is the most visible activity of the Hizmet movement, and so far the schools opened and operated by the movement around the globe are estimated to be in 160 countries and uh, have uh, reached a number of 1,300, more or less. So Mr. Gülen, to, to know him a bit better and will help understand the intellectual foundations of the movement. He's a scholar of Islam uh, with a personal uh, devotion and in, uh, dedication to study of his faith through a Sufi perspective and Sufi understanding, which will sound very familiar to the audience, I am sure, Muslim or non-Muslim, uh, subcontinent India has an amazing tradition of uh, Sufism uh, and uh, uh, similarly to Anatolia, Balkans, the Caucasus are similar contexts where Sufism has been very strong. And uh, it is almost a given foundation in Turkish Islam, if you call it this way. And Mr. Gülen is just a, a student and a child of that tradition. He's not bringing anything new into, into, how, into the way we interpret Islam in Turkey, but he is suggesting a fresh language to, to reinterpret the Sufi codes that have illuminated and motivated civic activism throughout centuries. So I have two quotes here. One is from Yunus Emre. He's a contemporary of Rumi. They lived in the same times in, the, in almost the same uh, area. So he says, we love the created for we love the creator. And Mr. Gülen's response to that message as a contemporary Sufi is to encourage everyone to the idea of living to let others live, dedicating our energy, soul, time, and resources for the well-being of the other. And when we say other, we mean it. This includes everyone. So, few other notes about Mr. Gülen. The, the core concepts that have uh, that have framed his intellectual universe is the idea of an upright life, helping the less fortunate, interfaith dialogue, nonviolence, and a commitment to education for the well-being of the society. So this preacher started to preach in Western Turkey, which is the most secular setting in the country, by the way. So it was very unexpected to him to attract a large audience. But to the contrary, his interdisciplinary style, the rich content of his sermons, where he would talk about not only religion, but also Western philosophy, Greek uh, mythology, enlightenment, scientific discoveries, enabled him to attract a large audiences. And these were mostly young people young students and business owners. 
So, having that audience in the mosque, he started to motivate them for community projects. The idea was, do you want to be a useful servant of God? Help people. And do not expect anybody else to, to push you for that. Take action. One of the first things he did was to promote the profession of teaching very powerfully in his books and sermons. So hundreds and thousands of young students decided to become um, teachers out of their respect to Mr. Gulen's message. And the other segment of his audience, the business owners, were were encouraged by Mr. Gulen to support these young teachers so they could start NGO education initiatives for the needy, for the poor that has merit. And this started a campaign in early 70s of providing residents, dormitories, stipends and scholarships for needy and capable students all around the country and led to a great change and a great wow. jump in the human resources of our country. Because up until those years, college education was available only to a small urban upper class uh, segment. So Mr. Gulen wanted to make this accessible to more people. And during a time of severe political conflict in Turkey, he said, don't be hostile to each other. This ideology or that ideology, secular, religious, Kurdish, Turkish, Alawi, Sunni, he wanted to challenge all these destructive fault lines of Turkish society by highlighting the real enemies, ignorance, conflict, and poverty. He doesn't, uh, he keeps a low profile and rejects the role of being a leader, but I would like to uh, describe him as a, as a transformational leader, one that empowers the individual rather than claiming a charismatic uh, role or a position in, in a hierarchy. That's not his um, style. And in the movement, Mr. Gulen is the intellectual challenge. He just has given a certain view for our search in meaning in life. He just described a certain frame, a window, and the rest is up to you and me, how are we going to realize the idea of living to let others live is going to be decided by the activists. And here we are talking about a, a clear dedication to peace building through, demo, um, through dialogue and education. What, what is motivating these people to engage in those activities? Why aren't they part of political activism, for example? Why don't they start a political party? Or as the literature on movements uh, clearly uh, suggests, why aren't they coercive, even violent? Because they are large in numbers and resources. So a brief note to, to understand all those reasons. In a, putting it very briefly, Mr. Gulen does not accept the idea of an Islamic state. Islam does not delineate a form of ideal state. There are just certain principles, such as consultation, justice, and, hostil um, and uh, uh, humility, and openness the right of the citizen to speak out and the responsibility of the ruler to listen and uh, respond. 
So these are all principles, but again, how we are going to realize is up to us. And according to Mr. Gulen, democracy with its participatory and representative mechanisms is the best form of consultation humanity has been able to develop so far. Of course, it is not a perfect system. It will keep evolving, but we shouldn't be unfair to democracy and uh, we shouldn't be blind to its merits. That's why he describes voting as a, as a religious obligation and not only as a civic duty. He, he has been a, a stalwart uh, defender of checks and balances in government and, uh, and has always highlighted the importance of the rule of law and authority because even the worst form of authority is, is not as bad as anarchy or chaos. And he has kept a very sensitive distance from endorsing any political actor for the last uh, 50 years throughout his entire civic career. This movement rejects the assumed binary division between secularism and devoutness, secularism and religiosity. For some people, it is a zero-sum game, and they are quite pessimistic about that. It is an either-or story. In this movement, in the Hizmet movement, people believe that a society can be composed of devout components, and this can be very diverse among themselves, religiously, denominationally speaking, but they can share a, a secular public sphere at the same time. There are very impressive uh, success stories in many countries around the world. So it is not a utopian idea of people being fully free in practicing their faith in a secular country. Politicizing religion and endorsing use of force by non-state groups in the name of religion is totally unacceptable. And Mr. Gulen brings very convincing, powerful Quranic principles and principles from the Prophet's tradition that in no matter what context we are talking about, Palestine, Iraq, you name it. Acts of suicide bombing, terrorism, targeting non-combatant people, these are all unacceptable, unfair to the dignity of human beings and unfair to the very message of religion. It is interesting, we are talking about someone who is clearly rooted in the Sunni school. So he is very loyal to Sunni text, Sunni methodology, and uh, Sunni interpretation of Islam simply. But this does not make him a scripturalist, a literalist, that has an exclusive understanding of religion. So between the literalist schools, which are now taking very extreme positions in many corners of the Muslim world, and between the reformist schools, which cannot appeal to Muslim masses, Mr. Gulen advocates a, mi a midway between the two, a, a, a balanced approach between the two, and highlights and defends the idea that we can be truly committed to the textual study of religion, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should end up in extremist, literalist, legalistic positions. So, we talked about projects. These are all local projects to talk about their characteristics. They are 
based on collective decision making. There is very strong ownership and transparency. Each school, each relief organization, each hospital, each university operated by the movement has its own board of trustees and uh, decision making structures that are familiar to anyone who is in the NGO sector. The projects are non-religious and non-denominational. It is an equal opportunity mindset that warmly welcomes everyone. To give you an example, the schools of Hizmet movement in Indonesia had a 10% Christian students segment. But this 10% was receiving 20% of the scholarship budget. The only criteria is the merit in, in those schools. As long as the student demonstrates merit, merit and willingness, this movement is ready and willing to support them, their education, all the way uh, into their PhDs. And I can uh, recall scores of uh, success stories of many students from disadvantaged countries doing successful careers. Interreligious dialogue is a key concept. And here, the movement, Mr. Gulen, does not claim to introduce something new into Islam. But dialogue is Islam itself. It is embedded in the very foundation of Islam. But we Muslims abandoned the idea few centuries ago. So it's our responsibility to revive this tradition of dialogue and coexistence wherever we, we are. So according to him, this is a religious duty and virtue. But he doesn't exclusively describe dialogue as an Islamic practice and believes that dialogue is a very Jewish practice, very Hindu practice, very Christian. And throughout our dialogue activities, we have witnessed that fact very, uh, very powerfully, very motivatingly. Wherever in the world we engaged in an intercultural, interfaith dialogue activity, the idea was most welcome by our counterparts. Just very briefly about what dialogue, interfaith dialogue did in Turkey, it totally shifted the image of non-Muslim people. Before the dialogue activities, the Muslim majority would, would be very suspicious of their non-Muslim fellow citizens. And it was a distance, psychological distance between the Muslim and non-Muslim the non-Muslim image was always associated with suspicion, treason, threat, all negative notions. The Journalists and Writers Foundation, as the first interreligious initiative in Turkey, challenged that distance. And now I can happily say in Turkey, the, the image has shifted positively towards diversity, coexistence, and understanding of each other. So when we say education, what is the education philosophy of the movement? The schools are demonstrating they have a very strong harmonizing function. They harmonize global and local. They are very open and welcoming to the local cultures, but they teach exact sciences, foreign languages, and prepare their students for a global competition at the same time. They also try to harmonize responsibility and independence. Yes, we need successful, ambitious, 
individuals, qualified individuals, well-educated individuals, but at the same time we should make sure that these individuals are also responsible ones. These individuals care about the rest of the world as much as they care about their own personal achievement. And the schools also try to harmonize the notion of faith and reason. These are quality schools at the same time, and they are inclusive institutions because they have a secular curriculum in every country and, as I said, have a strong equal opportunity po policy. Finally, oh, sorry. So, yes, we talked about academic achievement. This is one impact of the schools. Character building through role modeling at the same time. The schools have a very impressive um, empowerment function for the, the poor and capable student and for girls. In many disadvantaged settings, disadvantaged communities, these schools have attracted girls, sponsored their studies, and uh, helped them to start new careers as professionals. So the schools have a very strong gender women empowerment function at the same time. Another function of the schools is, is a peace-building function. These projects bring together a very diverse, a very colorful circle of people in many cases. The first schools outside of Turkey were opened after the collapse of the Soviet Union, mostly in Central Asia and Russian Federation. When our friends petitioned for a school in, in Moscow, the Russian authorities rejected their demand because there was total confusion about what their aim was. You know, given the, maybe the memory of imperial rivalry, so a group of Turks pop up in the heart of Moscow and tell Russia that they want to open schools in their country. Understandable reaction. It was a Turkish Jewish businessman who went to Moscow and successfully lobbied for the schools. His dream was to open a bicommunal school in Israel-Palestine that would educate Arab and Jewish uh, students at the same time. Unfortunately, he passed away but uh, we, we are sharing the dream and uh, there is an ongoing effort that we hope to see realize in the near future. And in Balkans, in Iraq, especially in the Iraqi Kurdistan, which is a radically diverse post-conflict setting, in Northern Ireland, Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya, where there is a history of ethnic, religious, communal rivalry, these, student, these schools attract students from all groups. And we, we hope that these children growing up together, studying together, becoming brilliant professionals and useful citizens of their countries uh, will not fight. That's that's the motivating promise for, uh, that motivates the activists in those schools. Finally, the schools have played a key role in preventing radicalism in some critical settings, some critical times. When the Soviet Union collapsed, for example, Central Asia was a very popular destination for many 
civic groups. And some of those groups were very extreme people in the way they understood religion. They had very radical notions of Islam. They had a lot of staff and a lot of money to take this ideological stream to Central Asia and set up roots and start recruiting people from local communities. Fortunately, these schools have played a very constructive role in preventing radicalism set ground in especially Central Asia and Balkan countries, all the post-Soviet settings. This is not my personal observation, but I am referring to very serious uh, strategic research reports and uh, government reports. So, and this has all been done by deeds rather than um, preaching anything in, uh, in words. So, I would like to thank you very much for your patience and uh, hope this long introduction has stimulated some curiosity and comments. Thank you.